Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Living in the Good Space. I am your host, Annette Johnson, the Fly Coach, and I am promoting Living in the Good Space, mind, body, and soul. My guests help me to inspire listeners and viewers to do the same. And they're not only living in the good space for themselves, but they're using their profession, their expertise, their passion, their knowledge to help others live in the good space also. And so my guest tonight, perfect guest, the work that he's doing around well-being and mindfulness. Uh, I'm so excited to have this conversation with him tonight. And he has an impressive background. And so I'm going to take my time to share with you who he is, because I want you to really take in um, all the work that he's done to be prepared to help people in this space. So Cedric Ashley is a coach. He's an author, a trainer, and facilitator, and he helps leaders, teams, and organizations thrive by aligning meaningfulness, values, well-being, and resilience. And I don't know about you, but I think this is exactly the remedy that the world needs today. Let me tell you about some of the certifications he holds that he uses with his clients. Um, he is certified in a number of personality type assessments and tools, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, known as MBTI. He's a certified practitioner through the Center for Applications of Psychological Type and Caliper Profile Certified through the Caliper Corporation and certified in a number of emotional intelligence tools. Cedric graduated from the Leadership Coaching for Organizational Wellbeing Program from the George Mason University, Center for the Advancement of Wellbeing. Cedric also received coaching from the Institute for Social and Emotional Intelligence and the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching, known as IPAC. And Cedric is also certified in Mental Health First Aid by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. He obtained his BA and JD from Rutgers University and his Master of Divinity degree from Drew University Theological School. So please help me welcome to Living in the Good Space, Cedric Ashley. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Cedric. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you tonight. How are you? I'm fine. I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah, I am so impressed with your background. Full disclosure to, to, to my viewers um, and listeners, we met um, at a church that, that we both attended. And when I met you back then, you were an attorney. You were, you were practicing law. I think you had your own law firm. I'm not uh -huh. sure. And yep. so when we reconnected on LinkedIn and I saw your profile, I thought, wow, you really made a shift in terms of your career and what you're doing. And so I'm curious to know, how did you make that shift from practicing law to moving into this work of well-being and mindfulness? Um, gra gradually and slowly, uh, because <laughs> I also, in from 2004 to 2008, I attended Drew uh, Theological School. So I got mm -hmm. my master of divinity degree. And I think I was still at uh, the church we attended around. Yeah, I was definitely still at the church we attended at that time. So I was in theological school as well. Why? I don't know. I just knew, I just know that I was drawn to, um, and, and, and I won't say compelled, but drawn to theological education. It wasn't mm. a matter of, oh, I want to go immediately go to somebody's course and become a licensed minister or anything like that. It was really going to school just to pursue uh, this, um, pursue something that was just, I was being drawn by. And mm -hmm. the same thing with transitioning over time from law to coaching, it just started out. I think it started out not, uh, 10 years ago, this December, where I, I received that first certification in, uh, Myers-Briggs, uh, type indicator assessments, uh, center for applied, uh, psychological type. Mm -hmm. And, and I can't even probably tell you why I pursued that, but it mm -hmm. could be, it could be related to my strengths finder profile where I'm kind of a, I have this love of learning mm -hmm. um, and just this curiosity within me. But, but 10 years ago, somehow I stumbled upon that course and I started doing workshops and training and, and debriefing of assessments for uh, folks who may have taken the, uh, the uh, Myers-Briggs assessment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that just started the journey of, of people development, professional development, helping people, achieve their best this past decade or so. 
Wow. And so I, you know, I'm in a lot of conversations these days around, um, you know, discovering your purpose and, and your calling in life. Do you feel like you, you wound up in this space because that was your purpose and, and your calling in life? For this season, like I'm a big believer that our purpose and calling is for a particular season. Mm. So for example, um, uh, Jeffrey, Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, uh, Richard Branson, and uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk. Um, and then even um, Bill Gates and his, not, his philanthropic work. Mm-hmm. Like that wasn't their calling or their purpose 30 years ago. It was building mm-hmm. up those companies and making a ton of money to now move off to this different stage. So I don't think they would be at this stage to do mm-hmm. what they're doing now if they didn't go to that go through that previous stage and have that purpose for that moment. So mm-hmm. I think for this moment and going forward to some period of time, this is my calling, this is my purpose, this is what I'm drawn to, this is what excites me, this is what inspires me, this is what I only say I'm drawn to, this is what pulls me, this mm-hmm. is what sort of that magnetic north that just draws me to, to do this work. Um, and what was drawing me to do the work when I was really doing it just um, where there may have been a continuing legal education program for some law program where I wasn't even doing it for any level of compensation. So I think that for this season and for the foreseeable season, don't know how long that is. I mean, I, I think I have a decent idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's where I'm called to be. This is my purpose for this season, this this people development. Because I, I, I thoroughly believe that we're in a place where we need people to help develop other people. Yes, yes. We're either going to head to a very, very bad direction nationally, as well as potentially globally, but I'm more familiar with nationally, or we're going to support the best in each other and rise out of the place that we're in right now. Yeah, I I agree with you 100%. I um, had a conversation with a... um, young woman today, I don't mm-hmm. want to, I don't want to disclose who she is, but a young woman today who's a part of a um, program um, and she is new to corporate mm. America. And, you know, I had thought about having this conversation with her. And then I wow. thought, you know what? I'm not, I'm not her mom. I'm her colleague. <laughs> so I was trying to pull myself back, but then I felt this, I just felt this I don't want to use the word obligation, responsibility. Uh I felt Mm -hmm. a responsibility as a seasoned Black woman who spent Uh three decades in corporate America Uh to share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just Mm -hmm. leave it at that. Uh 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 (laughs) To share. And it wound up being a lovely conversation. And so I think you're absolutely right. I think we need more people to feel comfortable and equipped and prepared to help others grow. Uh-huh. to help others navigate spaces uh-huh. that uh-huh. we've navigated, or uh-huh. at least that we're skilled and trained to help people um, uh-huh. navigate. And my column, I wanted my column to focus on on life balance. So it's mm-hmm. called the balance life theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and it focuses on well-being, resilience, mindfulness, uh, meaningfulness, all those, those great things. Um, and then BLT was a take on bacon, lettuce, tomato, the sandwich, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> For me, beef, bacon, lettuce, tomato, or focaccia. <laughs> that's another story. Um, and, and one of the main keys, I won't say I hate. I am not fond mm-hmm. of the term work-life balance. Mm. When you use the term work-life balance, work is already, because you've put in, Work is already won because you're putting work in equipoise with life. Work is here, life is here, work-life balance. You can't do that. Work is part of life. So it's really more of the hand, you know, so you got work, you got family, you got personal, you got social, you got civic, you got all, and it's really 10 fingers. You got all these things that are being balanced, sort of like um, pots on a stove. Some Mm -hmm. are simmering hotter than others. If you got a major work obligation, that's going to get more attention than Mm -hmm. maybe your social or civic time um, at a at a at a given period of time. That's going to get more attention. And then maybe we're clearly, hopefully, when you're on vacation, work still may pop up, but that pot is going to sim. That pot is going to be turned down a little bit 
while you're dealing with family or personal or social, whatever that vacation may, may look like. So I believe in the term life balance and work yeah. is a part of life. Cause you can't, you can't, if, again, if you call it work-life balance, you've now put work in, in, on one scale and life on another scale and work, everything else in your life has to, has to compete with, with work. And that means that it's going to outweigh it. And I just don't, yeah. maybe I'm a words, well, I am a wordsmith because I do a lot of writing, but, um, but words are important. Words yeah. are so important. Yeah. And I just hope more people begin to use the term life balance. Because the other, I love piece, it. the other piece is, as much as the work world wants to think that, well, you know, when you come here, you check, your, you don't check anything at the door. If your mom or girlfriend or wife or whomever is going through cancer or chemotherapy, you don't check that at the door. No. And let me tell you, I love I love what you just said about life balance, because if something happens to one of my children, my husband, my mother, like I'm there, there's no competition between exactly. work and my family because exactly. my family's going to always win. Yep. <laughs> They're going to always be the priority. Um, and so I, I love how you describe that, because for me. They're going to work will never compete. And right. work will never win over the well-being um, the, of my and family. The true leader and the true corporate culture will recognize that, and they will say, "Annette, go take care of what you got to take care," of. because we know when you come back, you're going to be on the grind for us, just like you always are. Uh, but I want to switch this conversation away from organizations to individuals, because mm -hmm. I know you're helping people. Um, connect to meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. And I love that term, the meaningful life. You're helping mm -hmm. people identify the meaningful life for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I read one of your one of your articles and you talked about approaching meaningfulness, if I have this right, mm -hmm. through seasonal changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as the seasons shift. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you mean by that. So <laughs> I'm a... Um... And I think this is part of like the 30, going on 30 something years of lawyer lawyering, where it's like, okay, here's the rule, here are the facts. There's, you know, you're kind of limited to what you can write. And I've I've gotten a little bit creative in, in writing. I've thrown some song lyrics in a very few legal documents and, you know, mm -hmm. got a, a decent nod from a judge and some contemporary phrases. Um, but I, I think I'm much more of a, I don't think, I know for my, strength finder um, assessment, I'm much more in some other assessments. I'm much more of a creative, intuitive, curious kind of person. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that allows me to write with a little bit more of analogy. So that the whole notion of, of um, looking at seasons of, mm -hmm. of one's life you know, you can look at the seasons of, of nature. So, you know, generally winter, I'm sure, that, and there's always some exception to everything, but generally mm -hmm. winter is a dead, let's start with spring. Well, let's start with, um, let's start with spring. So spring is a period of growth. I mean, mm -hmm. blossoming, you know, new things, new ideas. So, you know, you can look at spring as a season, you know, both not only the season of spring, but you can look at where are you in your season of spring? Where, when are you, birthing new ideas when are you mm -hmm. bringing out new things um and then summer summer is for the most part longest uh um longest period of of, of sunlight um generally temperatures and conditions that are going to help fully develop crops and mm -hmm. plant life and things of that nature uh, so where are you in your season of summer where are you beginning to fully develop that which you yeah. birthed in your spring and then fall is a period of, of beginning to some level of retrenchment, you know, leaves beginning to fall. Um, well, I should say autumn is that season and then leaves mm -hmm. beginning to fall. Um, where might you need to start pruning things like people mm -hmm. or concepts or ideas or whatever in your life, pruning those things, getting them, getting rid of them. And then winter, you know, winter is, we're about to hit a, well, depending on, at least as we're talking right now, we're about to see a storm hit us um it's kind of barren generally it doesn't support uh growth of any any kind of of life even certain animals go into hibernation during those periods 
so what is it that you need to let go of and, mm. and potentially metaphorically die? Now, obviously plants and things don't die in the winter and they come back in Rebirth. the spring. Mm-hmm. Right. But, but where, where is that? What do you, what do you need to let go of so that other things can birth themselves in spring or those <laughs> things that are working, you can continue to cultivate in that next, that next spring of your, your season. So I just think that's a way of looking yeah. at life and, um, and just the, the and, and we need all those periods. I mean, it's never, yeah. it's, always, it's not always going to be a period of birth. It's not always going to be a period of full growth. It's not always going to be a period of pruning and it's not going to be a period of decay and, and burying and, and, and letting, letting lie dormant for a period of time. I love the analogy. When I read it, I immediately saw aspects of myself mm. and how I move in and out of seasons. And I didn't realize it until you know, like say maybe the past 10 years Mm -hmm. that I experienced some signs of seasonal depression. Mm -hmm. So going into winter always felt like a dark, Mm -hmm. sad Mm -hmm. time for me. Mm -hmm. And everybody's all excited about Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mm -hmm. Wasn't my story. Like I Mm -hmm. couldn't wait, especially especially after my kids were no longer when they became adults. And so Mm -hmm. the traditions that we had as kids, Mm -hmm. which, you know, preoccupied me from that state of being were no longer there. And so there I was faced with it again, nothing to really distract me, you Mm -hmm. know, from it. And so when I read the article about the seasons and the reflection questions at, at the end that you wrote, I thought, wow, this is exactly what I have been, managing through over the past decade. This is probably one of the best seasonal year, the best year of seasonal changes for me, 2021. Mm. Mm. And going into the winter this year, mm-hmm. I even though I'm, I'm I don't necessarily look forward to the hustle and bustle of of, of Christmas and mm-hmm. all the commercialism attached to mm-hmm. that, I felt like this was my energy was higher. Mm. than it has mm. has been in years mm. Mm. and so I think you're onto something with with that 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 season mm. looking at the transition going from season to season because that's that's the reality of our life we're not mm-hmm. in the same season all the time right no no we we're can't. in different seasons different I'm in a new season of age I'm in a new decade of age and there's mm. different things that I'm going to be experiencing things that I'm having a good time letting go of I mm. might add <laughs> um and but the I love learning. Like yeah. I'm I'm learning things that I didn't even know I would have an interest in. Yeah. Um before the interesting so. thing about learning, like every like learning starts from not knowing. Like that, like yeah, particularly in the like in the 30th year of law, where like I can't go into court and be like, judge, I don't know. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know. You, you know, you, in this case, I don't I mean, there's a lot I don't know, you know. But, you know, if the at court, well, what is, you know, what is this opinion or what is your position on this? You can't really walk around saying, I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So it's so freeing now when I'm not having that lawyer hat on to be able to say, I don't know. So, you know, and in particularly for whatever reason, people think because you have a law degree that you have knowledge of everything. And you don't? You don't. You don't. No, <laughs> no, 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 I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, but the ability to say, I don't know. The ability to say I don't know does a couple of things, at least for me. One, it relieves me of an obligation I feel that I've got to give you an answer. Mm-hmm. Two, it empowers you to seek the answer for yourself. Like, How about that? Yeah, like you got to stand on your own. Like, mm-hmm. what do you think? Mm-hmm. So I'm very much these days in favor of or have a habit of making sure I'm not giving out answers. I'm making sure. And I think that is that coaching side coming out, making sure I have people work through things for themselves, let Mm -hmm. them do the long division, you know, Mm -hmm. let me see your math. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but that, that, that space of not knowing is the entry point of learning. Like you don't learn something you already know. So the more you can be comfortable saying, I don't know, I want to learn that and be curious and be open, at least for me, I just think it's just a, a great place to be in. Yeah, you know what I've I've empowered myself to do? I used to feel like I wasn't smart enough, Mm. you know, in some of the circles that I found myself Mm. in. And you're right. You have to seek knowledge. You have to go after that, which you don't know, if if, if that's what you want to know. Right. Let me tell you what my best friend is. 
Google. <laughs> I can be in meetings and somebody starts talking about something, a concept, or they mention a word and I don't know, and I write it down. I can do it now without you even knowing that I'm doing it. Like, I, I, I just write it down. And then I immediately Google it and I put it in context and I'm like, why didn't they just say that? You know, because some people like to talk in million dollar terms. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but it's fun for me now. It's almost like um, it's almost like a game, you know, yeah. for me. And and. I really look forward to discovering, you know, these new things, these new concepts, right. because I used to walk out of meetings and my head would be spinning and I'd be like, I don't have a clue uh -huh. what these people uh -huh. just said uh -huh. or what my role in this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's so true. I, I remember recently within the past two weeks, um, there was like a four letter acronym and I'm like, what is that? And just Google it. It's like, oh, and it made sense and it, it carried the day. Uh, yeah, so it, it yeah. So before I have to let you go, a couple yeah. more things I, I, I want to talk to you about. Um, you are certified in mental health first aid. What yep. does that mean? Um, that just like uh, non, just like regular first aid. Um, well, it's not just like that, but it, it's being able to be a... Um, not a first responder, but until a person can receive the immediate care they need or the long-term care they need, it's being able to really just be a listening board mm. or a sounding board or being able to kind of understand some level, not an expert, you're not anything, you're not a anything other than the person who has, knows a little bit that can hold things together until a person can receive the treatment they need. So if it's in a mm -hmm. workplace setting, it's being able to talk to somebody um, and being okay with asking, and this is part of the training, people think that, you know, by asking about suicide, that's going to make a person go do it. Uh, but it's being able to, to talk to them. And, you know, and as you're going, working through your conversation to be able to talk about whether or not you are feeling you know, any suicide thoughts, you know, do you, do you have a plan? And obviously the answer is yes. Then that's a whole nother story. If the answer is no, then it's a matter of being supportive, listening. It's almost like, well, it's not like coaching, but it's has elements of coaching, being supportive, listening, creating a space for, of, of trust, being non-judgmental, being present. I'm not mm -hmm. saying, oh, you know, wait one second. Okay. You were, you were talking about how you're feeling and how this has been such a a depressive period, but let me, let me return this call. So it's, it's being there, being present, listening to that person until either they, until either some medical assistance arrives or until a person or until some higher level professional comes from whatever corporation or whatever setting um, until there's some level of stability. Um, and, um, and I have, I have, I have obtained a greater level of, appreciation for mental health mm. um, crises or disorders mm -hmm. um, than before. Yeah. Uh, and how it's, and how so many of us experience some level of um, not necessarily some category diagnosed, but just even if you just take anxiety mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. how anxiety shows up, how that in and of itself, um, and we're not talking like, like you know, schizophrenia or bipolar mm -hmm. or anything like that, but just anxiety, some depression, um, how prevalent it is, how it impacts all of us, to many of us to some degree, and, um, and how we've got to get away from the stigma of, of, mm -hmm. of those things. Because when you think about it, you know, if a person has cancer, you know, stage four mm -hmm. colon cancer, you're not like, oh, oh, you know, it's just, we just don't understand when the, when the mind is not functioning the way we expect the mind to function in somebody, it's foreign to us. Mm -hmm. But when you become aware of what that may be, and, and it's just another part of the body that's not functioning properly, um, it, it takes the, it, it, it takes a lot away from it and you're mm -hmm. able to engage and approach a person and, and, and appreciate 
-hmm. what's going on. And I, I, you know, I don't have any data to support this, but, but I have to believe on some level that a lot of the dysfunction and just the stuff that we're seeing today you know, play out in the in the media that's captured in the media. I often, after hearing those stories and and listening, I often wonder how mental health plays a part in in that situation. Yeah, um, I, I don't have the year. This is 2022, 2022, but within the past six years, just how trauma, I mean, not necessarily post traumatic stress disorder, but just how trauma. That, that there's more, the, the, the mental health field is looking more at how trauma impacks people. And they're talking about mm -hmm. trauma, everything from workplace discrimination, harassment mm -hmm. and bullying, mm -hmm. growing up in a childhood where you, one or more parents were in jail, mm -hmm. insecure childhoods, food mm -hmm. insecure, home housing insecure, all those things, how that, and we know how that impacts communities. Domestic well. violence. Domestic, oh my gosh, domestic violence. And then just sometimes not even being, um, and even in the legal profession, they're looking at secondary trauma. The interesting thing about one of the studies in the legal profession, they were looking at how secondary, how certain cases, um, the existence of secondary trauma in court and judge uh, judges and court staff involving cases and how secondary trauma can begin to manifest itself. And I'm like, but you get that case like maybe once every two weeks, that lawyer lives with that case. So if secondary trauma is beginning to impact the judicial profession and, and court staff, then imagine what it's doing to, to imagine the impact it's having on lawyers. So mm -hmm. yeah, trauma um, in, in various forms is a very, um, is probably more prevalent than a lot of, than we realize. And then you couple that with the state of healthcare in mm. this country and not even be, even if you want it, even if there were people who wanted to get treatment, mm -hmm. maybe not even being able to mm -hmm. because they don't have benefits. They, you know, they can't afford it. Right. And, and the interesting thing is how we still, how some people still want to um, downplay mental health well-being, yeah. particularly um, when we went through the Summer Olympics. And I can't remember the the uh, our young sister who's the Olympian um, who had to take some time. Oh off. yes, yes. Oh, I can't think of her name, but I know who you're talking about. Right. Um, and it wasn't Gabby. It was. Um, but we 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 know we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And how it was sort of like you know poo pooed or downplayed. Yeah. And then you know a month later we saw either the report came out or or I think they think they may have released the report from the doctor, the pedophile doctor who had been abusing them all the whatever period of time he was abusing them. And you, you begin to see like, of course, a person cannot perform at their greatest level if they're still going through that or if they've just been interviewed or if they've been fighting for this issue or he's come, upcoming, I think he was being, may have been being sentenced, but where that's in the background and, and you have some of these people who want to say, oh, they just need to buck up and you know, get out there and perform on the stage for America. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. much deeper than, it than that. And only a fraction of people are being transparent mm -hmm. about that. Think mm -hmm. of all of the many, many, many people who are not sharing their story. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. just suffering in silence and they're just trying to figure it out. And then think of, so right, so you, you have the love, you have the iceberg, you have the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, this good, a good example. You got the tip of the iceberg of people who are sharing their story. Then you got the next level of people who are aware of it but can't share it. Mm -hmm. Then imagine that whole other piece where people don't even, aren't even aware, like this is going on and these things may be going on and it may be connected to the fact that, you know, I was food insecure growing up or I was mm -hmm. housing insecure growing up or mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in a stable home or whatever it may be, or I'm just being catching hell because I'm the, the, the first African-American female uh, cop in whatever department and yeah. and and that was you know 20 years so whatever period of time ago or mm -hmm. more, even more recently and it's not just oh you know I got to just keep going I just gotta you know no this this impacts us and so I, I'm being very very intentional about living in the good space mm -hmm. um this this was born in the early phases of the pandemic like mm -hmm. 
January of 2020, February of 2020. Mm. And, you know, I, like you said, there was something pulling you, pulling mm. you. I just felt like I want to, I want to be light mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and darkness, right? So we can mm -hmm. talk about the mm -hmm. dark spaces forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what, what I don't think we talk enough about is how, how we can help bring light to those mm -hmm. dark situations. And you talk about, you know, people being in a space where they can help others grow and develop. Mm -hmm. And so I'm being real intentional about the podcast because it's, it's a personal mission for me. Right. I've right. had to navigate some dark spaces mm -hmm. over, over my life. And I didn't always know how to do that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean I had a horrible life. It doesn't mean, right. I mean, obviously I had, I had a good life and I have a lot to be thankful for, right. but I used to feel guilty about going into those dark spaces because I had so much to, to, to be thankful for, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, you don't have a right to go there because right. you're blessed. You have all these blessings. You've had this great life and, right. you know, you've traveled the world, et cetera. And it, it made me realize that even though I'm in a good space mm -hmm. and I have everything I need, doesn't mean that I don't have to stay aware mm -hmm. of, you know, navigating the tough times when they come. Right, right. Because they're, they're in, I, I um, we're, we're all going to have those tough times. Yeah. It doesn't, and it doesn't really, it, like, it, we're all going to have, sometimes, you know, I'm sure somebody who's who experienced Katrina is like, you know, that you probably shouldn't use mm -hmm. that term, but I always say we're always going to have our Katrina moment. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, and the, and, and whatever that moment is not, and particularly everyone thinks resilience deals with the bounce back. Mm. the the bounce back, not from a true quantitative perspective but i'm just going to doubt the bounce back is like 10 mm -hmm. the true aspects of resilience is really about how are you what's your what's your set point before that incident occurs so mm -hmm. are you living in the good space you know mm -hmm. you know where's your joy are, mm. are, are, are you are you living out a, a life with meaning and, and, and purpose? Do you have like some some do you have some boundaries that are your principles? You know, do you have some values that you know, you know, we don't cross this line here or there. Whether it's whatever, whether it's you know mm -hmm. family and you know you can I may have to take a day, but I'm gonna go to Uncle Ray Ray's funeral because Uncle Ray Ray was like a daddy to me. You mm -hmm. don't understand that, but I'm gonna do that because that's 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 a family is a is a value for me. So it's inevitably doesn't matter what we're doing, even whoever's gonna be the next, the first African American female uh, Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that they have gone through, and there's stuff that they will go through, mm -hmm. and and and. And we have to acknowledge that and we have to be able to to go through because I think that particularly, you know, in tying it to this whole pandemic piece, maybe in, in one of those articles related, or one of those articles, Balanced Life Theory, I think it was titled Beyond Resilience, and it may have been even a recent article, talk about going through, getting through, and growing through. There are three mm. different things. Wait a minute, I, wait a minute. So, so, say that again because. Okay. <laughs> so first is go through. Go through. We didn't have a choice, and we won't have a choice, but to go through the pandemic, right? Like, unless and and and, and we all went through it. Some of us are still here. Some mm -hmm. of us aren't here. But mm -hmm. everyone who was alive come January twenty fifth, two thousand twenty, when it first kind of hit in Washington, you got to go through it. So that's mm -hmm. not a choice. Mm -hmm. I think it was for me. It was very important to will myself to say I'm going to get through it. Mm -hmm. Do I really know? No, but since I'm writing the script, it's my story. I'm going to say I'm going to get through it. Yeah. So I'm going yeah. to will myself. I'm going to have the mindset that I'm going to get through this thing. And yeah. so far, that's been the case. And then the third thing, I think, in the most important thing is growing through mm -hmm. it. So going, getting, and growing through it. What's your growth through this thing? I mean, I don't know. 800,000 people have died, at least in America. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know, 100 million may have, I maybe not 100 million, but a large number of people have, have had COVID, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of disruptions in economy and education. Mm -hmm. Like if my thought is like, if you haven't had this experience and still be here to say that this gift of humanity is significant and how will I better manage it? 
then that's like a big blown opportunity because there's at least 800,000 or so people who don't have that opportunity. So you got to grow through it. You got to figure out what's, you know, how am I living in the good space since I'm still here? What's mm-hmm. living in the good space? And it's like very, I mean, it could be a number of things for a number of people, mm-hmm. but if you don't ask, well, you don't have to ask yourself that question every morning, but if your subscribers, if your viewers use that as a test point, is this contributing to my good space? Yes. Tips, jobs, all kinds of stuff, organizations we've involved in, yeah. friendships we have, or people that we are associated with that we think are our friends and may not be our friends anyway. If it's not contributing to my good space, I got to prune it. I got to let it go. Listen, you you know what? We're going to have to definitely do a part two because I'm working on a definition for living in a good space right now for some th- other things that I'm going to do. Uh-huh. And I think you just summed it up just impeccably because wow. for me, when I started this podcast, it was about getting through, I didn't coin it that way, mm-hmm. but it was about getting through tough times mm-hmm. in the healthiest way possible, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So listen, things can come and slam you And sometimes we look for the things that are not healthy to get through. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's overeating. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. too much alcohol. Maybe some Mm -hmm. people depend on drugs, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever the, 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 it is, Mm -hmm. but what if we could be really deliberate and intentional about taking care of ourselves Mm -hmm. as we get slammed and we are going through these times Mm -hmm. that are really tough and challenging. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so what if we really, really dig deep and make sure that, you know what? I'm going to cultivate a space, mind, body, and soul that's mm-hmm. going to help me get through this. Mm-hmm. It hurts like, you know what? <laughs> it is painful. Mm-hmm. It has knocked me mm-hmm. off my feet. Uh-huh. I don't even want to get out of bed in the morning. Uh-huh. And maybe that's even a part of the self-care strategy is allow mm-hmm. yourself to lay down for a minute mm-hmm. and allow yourself to just reckon with the fact that this thing is deep and it's mm-hmm. heavy and it hurts. Mm-hmm. But have those self-care strategies in place to help you slowly but surely in the most healthiest way possible get through those times. Yep. Yep. No, no doubt. No doubt. And it's, so that's that's my personal work. mission. That's it's my personal work. mission. Yeah. yeah. It well, takes work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. And it, but it's but it's but nothing worth anything is easy. And yeah. and it's you owe it to yourself not just you, but we all owe it to ourselves to figure out like, how do we, you know, I always, I'm always about analogies and the, um, like a bear can't make an iPhone. Um, a rabbit can't take SpaceX up to space. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a deer can't create a COVID vaccine. Mm-hmm. So there's something about humanity, this gift of humanity from divinity that says, you know, we're operating at a higher level and we mm-hmm. owe it to ourselves and to our creator to like live a full throttle life with purpose, with passion, um, and and to allow ourselves to say, I deserve this. Like, mm-hmm. I, and if I don't deserve it, I deserve it to my. I deserve. I, I deserve to treat this human fleshly body, um, and this brain in a way that says I'm going to have a meaningful life because of the gift that was given to me by divinity. Yeah, yeah. You know what? As we begin to close out, tell me what the meaningful life is. When you say you're helping people identify the meaningful life, what does that mean? Um, the beautiful thing is, is that it's, it's what it means to that person. And I use the term, and I, I was very intentional about using the term the meaningful life, because it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of, it's not a meaningful life. Right. It's like, it's the, like, what is that? And it's, it's the meaningful life that's set forth for you. Mm -hmm. Um, that could be for some people that could be just, I just want, and it depends on what stage you're on life for some people could be, you know, I've, I've worked and worked and worked. I just want to, I just want to spoil my grandkids Mm. for some people. It could be, I'm at the beginning stage of my career and I want to be whatever it is in corporate America or government or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, for some, it may be, I just, I just want to, um, raise a good family. Um, for some, so, so it depends, but it's, it's defining what is, it's, it's getting a sense of what is meaningful to the person mm-hmm. and how does that person live out that, live out what is meaningful to them and use that as some way of creating a purpose or a vision, um, mm-hmm. having some principles to live by, some values that they believe in. It's almost like, you know, as much as 
I have a love hate relationship with corporations. It's stealing some stuff from corporate America. It's, you know, a lot of corporations have mission, they have vision, they have value. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And I just think we need to do that for our, ourselves. Yep. What's your I mission? agree. What's your vision? What's your yeah. what are your core values? You know, what are your principles? Um, and and carving that out, and obviously it should be one that's productive to the person, one that they have some level of passion about, one that um, depending on whether, because they could be independently wealthy, so it doesn't matter, but if they're not, one that allows for, sometimes you can't align everything. There are times Mm -hmm. when you may have to just do whatever job you're doing, because that's going to make the money. Here's an example. I've used example, this example, probably like half a dozen years. Somebody once told me that a friend of theirs, you know, their their bonus alone at whatever pharma company they were working at paid for their kids' college tuition. They didn't like the job. They didn't care about the job. They had a long commute, but it served its purpose. And its purpose was, this is going to pay for my kids' college tuition. I'm assuming by now they're no longer in the job, uh, but they weren't passionate about it. They didn't enjoy it. They didn't love it, but, but they found their joy elsewhere. So the money source was one thing. It wasn't also the joy source and they did something differently. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> that is my story. And I ain't ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes that's it. It's like, you know, and it, but, it, but, and you don't have to be ashamed because I'm fairly certain that whatever th- that in that story, you're still not a slog or a slob at the workplace. You're still mm-hmm. doing what you need to do. Mm-hmm. You're still delivering like you need to deliver. But it's mm-hmm. like, but guess what, folks? Like, this is a paycheck. This yeah. is a few other things, you know? As long as I deliver and as long as I, 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 I make my, I meet my commitment, that's all that matters. I don't have to love it. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And it's okay. Yeah. You know, I get annoyed when people are too prescriptive with other people's lives. Yeah. You know, like you said, with both of us, what is meaningful life is what you, how you define it. And it's not up for people to judge or debate, you know, what is living in a good space? It's what you, it's that space that you cultivate for yourself to be able to thrive wherever you are in life, no matter what comes. It's not for anybody else to judge. And I wish I had known this, you know, you go through those exercises and they say, what would you tell your 21 year old self? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. then but I understand why I didn't because Mm -hmm. we have to grow we're born to grow and go through you know different things in life to shape you know the the people that you know God created us uh us to be so I I I get it I had to take those knocks and those beautiful thing I like about this the coaching and training space as opposed to the law space is I don't have to get into fights over whatever statute six three b (laughs) four seven well it says this it says this in this case like I'm just here to help facilitate a person live the meaningful life among mm-hmm. other things or, yeah. or, de- or helping teams, individuals and organizations develop resilience. And, yeah. and that's, I'm just really a support role. Like I'm not, mm-hmm. if you don't want to do it, that's cool. Like you already mm-hmm. got your A for the day. Like you can yeah. sit in the cor- corner quietly and don't participate in anything. It doesn't really matter. And then another group can be like fully engaged. So, but there's no right or wrong at all. Like we just, and there's, and the only right or wrong There's first of all, there's no right or wrong, but if there's going to be some level of right or wrong, that can only be in your life. Like you oh, can't yeah. judge this person. Yeah. Like you, I just, yeah. Listen, I have to have you back because I want you to come back. I want to do dedicate some episodes to, exposing people to some of these tools like you've been certified in so many different tools and I'd love to talk a little bit about what are those assessments and you know what's the value in them what what do they teach people about themselves and I just discovered reading your bio too that we both went to IPEC so that's where I got my coaching certification is um through IPEC yep and I and I started a long I did like kind of their like I can't remember what, can't remember what program I called, but it was, it was like a portfolio kind of program. So I did some stuff with them years ago mm-hmm. and then I completed my, um, well, it's never completed because I think I'll be in another program, but I completed the initial coach training stuff with um, uh, with uh, George, uh, George Mason. Uh, but mm-hmm. there's some other programs out there that I really like. Uh, Newfield Network is one, mm-hmm. Corinthus with team coaching. And again, that's just me, the love of learning. So yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be, done you're a lifelong learner 
Yeah. And, so, and, yeah. and, 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 and we'll benefit from that. Yep. <laughs> yes. We'll benefit yes. from your journey. Yes. This has been, this has been um, a great conversation, but I can't close without asking you this question. I ask all my guests, mm -hmm. what does living in the good space mean for you? Um, living in joy, mm. living with passion, um, living with continually pursuing purpose, um, because I don't know that you'll it'll ever be perfected or completed. Um, and if it does, I'll somebody will probably be reading it at my funeral. Um, so passion, joy, purpose, um, keeping that which is negative out of my life. Mm. Um, and that can be from from news or just cutting off news at a certain hour, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, people, or it, it, it's a whole bunch of things. So keeping, keeping boundaries in place um, and continuing to strive to, um, to achieve those things. Cause I, like, I, it's just, it's, 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 I don't think it's ever complete. Yeah. I think it's, it's a continuation of, of those. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 and I would end it by saying, also trying to positively, positively impact the lives of other people. I mean, that's, that's kind of, in this day and age, it's kind of like, yeah, whatever, that's corny. But you just have to be honest with yourself. And to the extent that um, the more I can do to help other people live their best life, mm -hmm. the better I'll, I'll be. Yeah, this was so good. So good. Thank you for taking time to... Um, have this conversation with me. Um, let people know how they can follow you because you've got some great programs that you're offering. How, how do people get in touch with you if they want to explore coaching? Um, easiest way is uh, LinkedIn. That's where I drive most of my contacts, LinkedIn. So Cedric Ashley on the LinkedIn platform. Um, if you, uh, you want to follow me with my writings, uh, if, if you go to substack.com and just put in Cedric Ashley or The Meaningful Life, it should pop up and you can click subscribe to it. It's free. So mm -hmm. Cedric or cedricashley.substack.com um, is another way to follow me. So Substack, LinkedIn, those are the two main, uh, all, uh, those are two main. Okay. Uh, you can follow me. Yeah, there's some other okay. stuff. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for sharing. Thank you for your um, graciousness of time tonight. Uh, and um, I'll definitely be inviting you to come back and share some more. Uh, thank you. I had a ball. It just time, time flies when you're having fun. When you're having fun. Exactly. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.